worship here at Dills Creek Baptist Church. We are literally here with bells on today <laughs> because we are so excited to celebrate uh, a special day that we look forward to uh, every year in the life of our church, and that is Homecoming Sunday. And today we are just so uh, thankful to celebrate 234 years in the life of our church. Before I forget to do this, I do want to thank uh, all of those who serve on the homecoming committee. I'm not going to call them by name, uh, but they work year-round to make this a special event, to make everything that we're going to enjoy and celebrate today uh, just be a very special occasion, and so I do want to thank them. I want to welcome you if you're a visitor with us today. I know that uh, many of you have traveled uh, some distance to be here with us. Uh, maybe you no longer live in this area, but you grew up here at Mills Creek, and you are back here with us today to celebrate. We welcome you here. Uh, if you are visiting with us for the very first time today as a guest, if you look in the pew rack in front of you where the offering envelopes are, you'll see a small rectangular card there that says welcome on it. And that is a visitor's card. And we'd love to have you fill that out uh, and drop that in the offering plate when it's passed a little bit later in the service so that we can have a record of your visit and get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we do have some special guests with us today that I want to mention uh, by name. Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Mike Coggle and his wife Gail with us. They are no strangers uh, to us. Uh, Dr. Coggle was here through 1992 and 1993, I believe it was, as interim pastor. He has been a friend and advocate of Neal's Creek Baptist Church for many years and been a personal friend and mentor to me uh, through his work and leadership at Campbell Divinity School. And so he is here to be our homecoming speaker and also to, to help inaugurate our revival this morning because that is also coming up this week at Neal's Creek Baptist. So we are glad to have you here, Mike and Gail both. Also, we have some members of the family of Roy and Nathaniel Parker. I think uh, three of his daughters are with us today. Uh, you will remember that I believe it was last year we dedicated the, the history display case uh, in the fellowship hall uh, in honor of Roy and Nathaniel Parker. And so there's some great information in there. I, I hope that as you are waiting in line for the food that you'll just take a few minutes and look at some of the things that are in there to learn a little bit more about the history of our church. There's some special things in there uh, from Dr. Coggle's time here as interim pastor, and so please take a moment to notice that, and again, we're glad to have uh, the members of the Parker family with us today. Uh, are there any former pastors or pastors' families that have traveled to be with us today? But I, I don't believe I have seen any, but just in case. Okay. Uh, just a few uh, words uh, in the way of announcements. Uh, for today, I will, at the end of the service, go over some instructions for our food that we will enjoy uh, after the service today. Uh, our uh, theme for this homecoming and for revival is from Galatians 2.20, Christ who lives in me. And so you will see inserted in your bulletin uh, another flyer for the revival. I would encourage you to share that with a friend or a neighbor. We look forward to our revival services coming up uh, this week, tonight. Uh, our service will begin at 7 o'clock. Reverend Brian Kinlaw will be our speaker. Uh, each night before revival, we will have a prayer time in the ladies' parlor beginning at 6 o'clock. So if you would like to come and help us uh, begin and, and really center ourselves in the presence of God at 6 o'clock each night, we will be having prayer time. Uh, Tuesday night will be youth night, so we encourage you uh, to bring uh, any children, grandchildren, friends, uh, youth that might be in your neighborhood. We'd love to have them uh, come join us Tuesday night uh, for youth night. Uh, also, uh, today, as you well know, we take up a special offering for homecoming. Uh, the purpose of that offering this Sunday will be to go towards the Hills Creek Baptist Church Scholarship at Campbell Divinity School. Uh, we thought that was uh, appropriate today, and we are uh, coming off a big win yesterday with Campbell football, and so I hope that you will give toward that as the Lord leads. We have been blessed at this church to have uh, numerous people uh, in, in the history and, and even now that have gone through a wonderful theological education program at Campbell Divinity 
Kennedy School. And so that's where uh, our offering will go today. If you are giving for that, remember that you need to designate that offering in the memo line, the check, or on the offering envelope uh, for the Campbell University Scholarship. Uh, are there any other announcements that we need to be aware of? All right, if you would just look quickly at your prayer list. I do have a few names that I want to mention there. Uh, I would, you will see at the top of the list our prayer topics for this week. Uh, I would ask that you would continue to remember Miss Ellen Johnson for your prayers. Uh, Miss Ellen had a fall recently at Greenlee, and uh, she is uh, just continuing to be uh, feeble, and we need to remember her and Pat in our prayers. Uh, John Ennis is going tomorrow for another MRI scan, and they will determine his course of treatment after that scan. And so let's remember John and Giselle tomorrow. Continue to pray for Larry Searles and Beverly Adams as they recover at home from recent health issues. And uh, Miss Bobby Wilkins, a longtime owner of the family restaurant in Anger. Uh, it is incorrectly printed on your prayer list. She is at UNC Hospital. Uh, receiving hospice care, uh, and the family uh, saw Kay and Frankie on Friday, and they will certainly appreciate our prayers. As it, it appears, Miss Bobby will be making her transition uh, from from this life uh, into eternity. And also, just one more that I want to lift up to you: our administrative assistant Janet Parker. Her dad, Gerald Dupree, has been in the hospital for a little over a week at Wake Med. And this week he has had both a minor heart attack and a stroke on Friday. And so he's having a lot of heart problems and uh, we need to certainly remember Janet in our prayers. And so if, uh, if she is, has to be out of the office some uh, this coming week, then you will certainly understand why. Are there other prayer requests or praise reports to come before the body of Christ this morning? If not, then let's bow as we open our service with a word of prayer. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, you have been our very present help in time of trouble, our jubilant melody in time of celebration, in seasons of plenty and seasons of need, in times of distress and in times of deliverance in times of hurting, and in times of healing. O oh God, you have worked all things together for our good. And we come today to gather in this house of worship with so great a cloud of witnesses to give thanks for where you have brought us and what you have done through us in this body of Christ called Neal's Creek Baptist Church. In our 234-year history, we must confess that we have not always listened nor have we always obeyed. We have at times been a stiff-necked, hard-hearted people. Yet this I recall to my mind, and therefore I have hope that great is your faithfulness, O God. Your mercies are new every morning. You have abounded in steadfast love from generation to generation. And surely we must repent of those times when we miss the mark, but today we must also celebrate those times that we have gotten it right by your help and with your all-sufficient grace. There have been countless children raised in the foundations of the Christian faith. Many husbands and wives joined together in the covenant of marriage here at this altar. Many baptisms and rededications in this sanctuary. Many lifelong witnesses for the faith who have blessed us with their legacy and our church family. There have been those who have touched our lives through a hug, a handshake, a smile, a prayer, an encouraging word. For all of these blessings, Lord, we pause today to say thank you. We celebrate this 234th homecoming as a time to revive our commitment to our personal walk with you and to renew our efforts to impact our community for Christ. We join with your people Israel who often pause to look back and to remember the great moments of your power in their history and in so doing gain strength and resolve for the journey ahead. Today we say with them, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, where would we be today? On this special day of celebration, we ask that you would inaugurate in us a revival, 
We ask that you would create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. We humbly ask that you would stir our hearts through your word and reveal yourself to us through our acts of worship so that we would truly be revived in the depths of our soul. We pray that in this season we might experience you in such a real way that we would be transformed by the love of our God to love you more fully, more deeply, and to love our neighbor more genuinely and more justly. As we pray that prayer, would you taught all your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
right to that point. <laughs> remembering, I'm sorry, and remembering five of our senior uh, members of the former pastor. We have gone on to be with the Lord since our last homecoming. They are John Marshall Johnson. Johnny died on November the 15th, 2013. He was 87 years of age. I said young to start with, but I meant to say that again. I'm sorry. He was young. The son of the late Chesley and Harley Wester Johnson. He is survived by his wife, Janet Hood Johnson, and two daughters, Janet Louise Johnson, Mildred Hinkle, and Dr. Catherine Coates, and a son, John Marshall Jr., and a grandson, Brian. John and Janet live in their residence at 45 Matthews Road, uh, in the Lillington address, located on the Chesley uh, Johnson Lanes. Johnny was a master carpenter and home builder. Having never met a stranger, uh, he was a great storyteller. He was a very sensitive person, especially concerning his girls. A story has been told that one night when one of the girls cried, Johnny got up to get in the child's room. Uh, Janet told him not to bring the child to their bed. Johnny went to the little girl's room and got in the crib with her to get her to stop crying. He explained to Janet a little later, well, you didn't tell me to not get in her bed. We remember Johnny's big smile when we see him in church and when we visited to him during his long illness. Margaret Cash Johnson Margaret died March the 15th of 2014. She was 84 years young. She's the daughter of the late John Thomas and Westfield Bowling Cash of Chinook County. She was predeceased by her husband, Parkman Johnson. She is survived by sons Tommy and Andy Johnson, two grandchildren and three great grandchildren. Margaret and Park lived for many years on the James. Norris Road among the Will Johnson family. Margaret is remembered as a happy, free hearted, cheerful person, especially during her last years uh, while she was a resident at Brookfield Assisted Living Facility. First with her, and then for several years alone, but always cheerful and friendly with the family residents of Brookfield. Margaret was very supportive of Park, enjoying their time together fishing, uh, going to the coast to fish, gardening with Park and Eddie, and sharing their garden's produce with family and friends. Henry David Hinky Jones. Hinky died March the 1st of this year. He was 71 years young. He's the son of Paul and Peggy Jones. David was a very, very supportive and devoted person to his wife, Joyce, who in 2012 after a long battle with cancer. He is survived by two daughters, Amy Jones Johnson and Alicia Jones Auburn, and two grandchildren. Hinky and his family lived along Highway. Uh, 55, about one mile south of Andrew. He was a businessman in the Andrew community for many years, but more importantly, he was a faithful, active member of our church, serving as a deacon and supporter of our efforts to serve God as a part of the Christian community, especially serving uh, in our, as a strong base in our choir. choir. Hinky was a lover of gospel music, and almost every Tuesday night he went to Harley's Barn to participate in the singing of gospel music. 
especially seeing this old house as the son of it. He is remembered as a hunter, a fisherman, an outdoorsman, an advocate, and good golfer. He had a hobby of collecting arrowheads and was somewhat of an expert on that subject. Peggy G. Jones. Peggy died May the 17th of this year. She was 98 years young. She was the daughter of Henry Macon and Essex Agnes Stone Goodwin of Chatham County. She was predeceased for her husband, Paul L. Jones, and her son, Henry David Inky Jones, and her daughter, Judith J. Fountain. She is survived by her daughters, Ann J. Suggs and Jean J. Johnson, and her son, Paul Bo Jones. Ten grandchildren, seven great grandchildren, and five great great grandchildren. Miss Peggy and her husband lived in Hardy County for many years in the Irwin and Andrew communities. The last residence located in the Wilmery Road in Andrew. She was devoted and supportive to all of her family and enjoyed life with her family and friends, especially with her church family and quilting friends. She enjoyed cooking for her family and one of her favorite dishes was banana pudding. To our benefit, at church conferences and dinners. Ms. Peggy is remembered as a quiet person and kind to all. She enjoyed being one of the lamp lighters and going to the beach and other trips with that group and playing bingo. She dearly loved her Lord and from time to time made witness of the same during worship service here. Margaret Johnson Matthews Margaret died September the 18th of this year. She was 95 years young. She was the daughter of William Adam Will and Merle Rose Hamilton Johnson. And was raised on their farm of what is now known as uh, the John James Norris Road. She lived for many years at 6069 Highway 210 North. Uh, within sight of the parents' home. Also, also lived for some time at Brookfield Assisted Living Facility. She is survived by a daughter, Judith Ennis Smith, and a son, John Aaron Ennis, and five grandchildren and nine great grandchildren. Margaret is remembered as a hard worker in her home and place of employment in the houseware department of Hudson Belts. Raleigh, assisting many brides in choosing their crystal and china patterns. She was particular about her home, her yard, and flowers, keeping her yard speaking span, keeping her home speaking span, and the yard speaking span, and, and her flowers attractive. She was a strong, independent person and set a firm Christian legacy for her family and friends. <coughs> Reverend Archie Gerald McKay. Gerald uh, died in September of this year. He was 87 years old, I don't know exactly how old. Reverend McKay became pastor of our church during the fall of 1972 and served until May of 1979 and ministered well to many of our our members during his time with us. At the time of his death, he was living near Florence, South Carolina, and he survived by his wife, Frances, and their four children, Tony, Hope, Audrey, and Trent. We remember him for his progressive leadership of our church to include construction of a new educational wing, consisting of a new kitchen, Fellowship hall, nursery, preschool, classrooms, restrooms, church office, and pastor study. And the development of strong children and youth programs. I will never forget Gerald dressed in 1700 era clothing. 
right in the church with a mule at our bicentennial celebration in July of 1976. We are grateful to God for each of these Christians as we remember them as members of our church and reflect on, our, on their contribution to our fellowship and to their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. We give God the glory.
Will you please stand if you're able for the reading of our scripture? Our Old Testament scripture comes from the 45th chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 5. And then we're going to turn over to Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. God bless the reading of Scripture that we might hear and do His word. Thank you, Alex and Lee, for the reading of Scripture and choir for the beautiful anthem and congregation for the wonderful invitation to be here with you today on this good homecoming Sunday. It's a pleasure to be in Mills Creek Baptist Church today to see all of you, uh, to be a part of the wonderful history of this church, and to see uh, so many wonderful faces, friends of long standing. Uh, with whom we've lived and worked and worked uh, in this community and county, and it's a great joy to be here with you today. 234 years. I know what I'm seeing today. It is important to see, and it is important to know what you're seeing. Today, I think I can see that, and I hope we all can. 234 years. Faith has endured. Faith in God has endured in this place. And the lights are on. And the people are here. And the Bible is open. I know what I'm seeing when I'm with you today. Not many days ago, I participated in the 100th birthday of a minister friend of mine. His name is Ken Bauer. He's a special friend, and I respect him and I love him dearly. And he had reached his 100th birthday. And I was asked to say a few words on that occasion for him, riding up there. Uh, I thought of something I would say to him, not original with me, but something I had heard from time to time. And that is that it's not how many candles are on the cake. It's how good the cake is. <laughs> and just as I was saying that to Ken, I was convicted that there's more to it than that. 100 years. It is important how many candles are on the cake. Neils Creek Baptist Church, 234 years. It's not important how many candles on the cake, but how good this cake has been. And yet, it is important that the candles have been on that cake 
and it's been a wonderful and great legacy for all of you. Thank you for the wonderful privilege to be here this day. I know what I'm seeing when I see you and to see this church. I'm also very proud to be with your pastor and wife today. Some of you know stories of my conviction in the pastor search days of who the next pastor of this church ought to be. I had reached that conclusion and shared it with a certain young man that was sharing uh, that pastor search committee. And I'm glad you reached that conclusion. <laughs> Some of you know that Chris is in beginning his doctoral work at Campbell. He was in my seminar the past few weeks. Don't tell him I said this. <laughs> but he could have taught it and I could have sat over there. And that's how much respect and love I have for him. And it's a pleasure to be with him and listen to that. Two great texts from the Bible for Homecoming Sunday. And I want you to experience both of them. Powerful texts in the Bible. And they speak to the very reason that we gather here this day. Homecoming day. Celebrating 234 years. Faced with the challenge of knowing what we are seeing. The first one. The first one is that epic, dramatic story in Genesis 45 where Joseph stands before his brothers who long thought him dead. And he stands before them having now come to see them for the first time in many, many years. You may remember the story. Joseph is the 11 of 12 brothers born to that icon of Israel Jacob. Though he was the 11th of 12 brothers, some of you will remember that he was the oldest son. He was the oldest son of Jacob and Rachel and another son, Benjamin, his younger brother, born to that union. And you'll remember the story of Joseph that he enjoyed favoritism, excessive favoritism from his father. And very little favoritism from his brothers, some of which was his own fault. You may remember the breaking point, or points. One of them was the strutting around he did in his coat of many colors that his father had made for him. The other was that he had a dream. Joseph was blessed with this gift of dreams which were many times channels of divine communication. And he had this dream, and he told his brothers this dream, and the dream was that one day all of you are going to bow in obeisance to me. Well, that did not go over well with those brothers. And both of those things became breaking points. And you'll remember it was then, after that dream, that those brothers hatched the plot that Joseph has to go. And so they sold him to Midianite traders and had him out of the way and created a trickery plot to convince the old man Jacob what had happened to his son Joseph, which wasn't a true story, as you will remember. You'll remember that years passed. The brothers long thought Joseph dead. And being sold to those Midianite trailers, the providence of God took over and he wound up in Pharaoh's house in Egypt. And he had ups and downs. You will remember in all that story in Pharaoh's house. But eventually, his wise skills for administration came to the forefront and Pharaoh put Joseph an Israelite in charge of the grain that was so important because the area was being affected by a terrible famine. Do you remember the dream of the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine? 
The famine had affected Israel. And the old man now, Jacob, knew that they, his family would not survive unless they went to Egypt to get the grain and bring it back to Israel. And it was then that the brothers made that long journey and then that dramatic day, that unbelievable day happened when these brothers came down before the very person put in charge of dispensing the grain, Joseph. Dressed in his Egyptian attire. And no wonder they did not recognize him. But Joseph recognized him. And then he did maybe something he should not have done. He wanted to find out if they were really changed men or not. And so he inquired about their family and a younger brother. And he said, I will give you grain, but I'll not give it until you go back and tell your father to let your younger brother come here. And to make sure they come back, he put one of the brothers, Simeon, in prison to hold him so that they would come back with Benjamin. And they did. And you'll remember that this... this plot that Joseph had going on was not finished. It was later then that he hid the goblet in the traveling sack of one of the brothers and they brought him back here. And then again, he wanted to see they were really changed men and if they would indeed confess that they didn't even know where that goblet came from and they did. It was here that our story picks up. You will remember that it was then with those brothers standing before him, Joseph knew who he was seeing. He knew what he was seeing. And then he hollered, clear the room! Clear the room! And he made everyone leave. And then we're told in the Bible that the great man Joseph went into a room by himself and he wept, wept, and wept all the years of bitterness and estrangement and loneliness came out. You see, you can't keep up a, a drama like that for long. You just can't keep that up for long. And when he composed himself, we're told in the Bible that he went back and he stood before his brother. And he probably took off some of that Egyptian attire. And then he made the big announcement, I am Joseph. Your brother is my father still alive. We're told in the Bible, careful writing, careful writing it is, that the brothers took about five steps back. They were shocked. They could not believe. They thought their brother Joseph long dead. And they were afraid. And he said, no, no, come here. Come close to me. God is the one that I now know sick me. I've come to understand all this in, in providence. In the providence of God that God has sent me here. Come near. I will not harm you. Is my Father still living? Joseph knew what he was seeing standing in front of him. He was not seeing duplicitous men, but brothers. His brothers. He was not seeing criminals who had done that act to him, but he was seeing family. He was not seeking revenge, but trying to find reconciliation with his family. He was not in the midst of something that was coincidental and incidental. He was in the midst of something he believed was providential. That God had put him in his place. And he knew what he was seeing. You may remember the rest of the story. The rest of the story was that the grain was able to go to Jacob, but Joseph had Jacob and the rest of his family brought to Egypt so they could live during the final days of this famine with one request. And Joseph said, if I die here, if I die here, I want you to carry my bones 
out of Egypt when you leave and carry them back to Israel. And you may remember, fast forward in that story a little bit on that night of nights when another great icon of Israel, Moses led the people out of bondage across the Red Sea. And what did they carry with them? The great Ark of the Covenant. And they carried with them the bones of Jesus. And they carried back to Israel. It's important to know what you're seeing. Fast forward with me, if you will, now to the dusty roads of Tyre and Sidon. This is the story of Matthew's Gospel where Jesus now, Matthew 15, Jesus and the disciples go on a men's retreat. And you remember much has been happening in the life of Jesus. He's given the Beatitudes. He's done a good number of apparel. He's given the great teachings in Matthew 10 and 13 about discipleship in the kingdom. He's performed many miracles. And now he is needing the Spirit to be replenished in his own life. And he retreats to the dusty territory of Tyre and Sidon on a men's retreat. Maybe you know a little bit about men's retreats or men fishing trips. Usually they don't want women around. Men love women, but sometimes when they go off on a retreat like that, they just don't want them around. It's better to have a women's retreat with no men around, probably some of them. Are. And as they were going there, the Bible says, a woman, a Canaanite woman, showed up. And the disciples said, "This we're on retreat now. We're on retreat now. He must leave. And she said, I saw him talking about Jesus. I know who he is. I know who he is when I look at him. And I'm not leaving. I need him. And the disciples, frustrated, went to Jesus and said, You get rid of him. <laughs> you get rid of him. We try and we can't. And if you read this, Jesus went out. Jesus went out and talked to her directly, playfully, but firmly. And she said, I know who you are. When you came walking through this territory, I saw you and my eyes were laid upon you. And I knew who I was seeing. And I, I could not leave. I need you. Jesus said, what did you do? And my daughter is sick. And she has great need. And Jesus talked with her a little while more and said, You can go home now. Your daughter's home. And he went back into the disciples and said, Man, this, this is what this retreat's all about. This is the food that we have that the world knows not of. Jesus knew who he was seeing. And she knew who he was seeing in him. Congregation, is there anything more important today on homecoming day than for you to know what you're seeing? 234 years. Neil Street Baptist Church. Let me ask you, when you look around your church family today, do you know what you're seeing? Let me ask you, when you look around this community, that God has placed you right in the middle of this community, and you see all that is happening around you, do you know what you're seeing? I can help you with that. Because I know. And you know. When you're looking around at each other and looking around at community, we're seeing people who are trying to make it. We see people who are trying to keep their families together. They're trying to keep marriages together. They're trying to keep, keep their jobs going. They're trying to keep the grass going. They're people who are trying to. It's important to know what you're seeing. Can anything more wonderful happen from Neil's Creek this very day? That on 
this 234th celebration is that there is a profound awareness within our church of what we have and who we're seeing, of looking around our community and knowing what we see. Joseph that day knew who he was seeing. That woman, when Jesus passed through, she knew who he was seeing. And when Jesus came to speak to her, he knew who he was seeing. And it's important too when we look at the Bible. Isn't it? I can tell you, when I look at that picture in the Bible of those three crosses on Calvary's hill and Jesus on that center cross, I know what I'm seeing. And I believe it in the depths of my heart. When I look at that picture with that stone rolled away in front of that tomb, I know what I'm seeing. And I believe it in my heart. A true story. A very true story. The Christian season of Lent had rolled around. Some of you know that the Christian season of Lent, L-E-N-T, begins on Ash Wednesday, sometime usually in February, and goes through Palm Sunday, which ushers us into Holy Week, which leads to Easter. All of this is to remind us Christian believers of the suffering and death of Jesus, what Jesus went through for all of us. On Ash Wednesday, which is the first day of Lent, there's a beautiful tradition in churches. You might like to start it here. Where people come to worship at noon. And on Ash Wednesday, the minister, the priest, will from ashes, ideally collected from the burning of the palms the previous year on Palm Sunday, and held over for Ash Wednesday the next year. Ministers will usually put the sign of the cross from the ashes with their finger on the foreheads of the participants. It is a sign of repentance, yes, but it's also a sign of memory, of remembering what Jesus has done for us all. The pastor went to the service that day, participating as others, and the minister, the priest, put the sign of the cross on his forehead. As he left the service, he decided to stop by the hospital. He needed to make a visit. Decided to do it on his way home. And as he went in, a well-meaning person, a brief or casual acquaintance, called his name and said, Pastor, wait just a moment. You've got some dirt on your face. Let me get a tissue and I'll, I'll get it off for you. He said, no, no. I've been to an Ash Wednesday service. This is a sign of the cross. Today's Ash Wednesday. Today's the day that Christians wear the sign of the cross as a sign of memory of Jesus and as a sign of repentance. She said, I don't, I don't know that story. He sat with her briefly, not long. And he told her a little bit about the story. The story of Jesus. The story of the cross. <coughs> Why Christians would have crosses on their foreheads. And he heard a little bit of her story as well. And as they talked, it came time for him to leave. And he could tell that she was moved by the story. And as he got up to begin to go, she said, Before you go, do you mind if I touch that cross on your forehead with my finger? You see, I need some of that. I need it. So, the pastor knew what he was seeing. He helped her up. And he could tell from her moist eyes that the moments had been meaningful. And she reached over and she touched the cross. 
as he left, he thought about all the people that need some of that. Niels Creek, do you know what you're seeing? When you look at your church family, when you look around at this community, You know what I think? I think we see people who need some of these. I think we see legions of people who need some of these. And the truth is, don't we all? Don't we all? this morning is hymn number 300 without him and I just want to extend the invitation if you have never come to see and know who the Lord Jesus Christ can be in your life I invite you to come today if you see and you know something here at Mills Creek Baptist Church that you want to be a part of something of what God is doing here we would invite you to join your faith with ours and to be a part of this body of Christ. Maybe you have a need this morning. Just like that woman in Matthew chapter 15. Maybe you have a need. And you know that only Jesus can meet that need for you. And you need to come to the altar and bow this morning. And approach the throne of grace. I would invite you to do that. Let's respond together. Let's see and know the goodness of our Lord. As we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, it's number 300. Without Him, I would be nothing. Without Him, I'd surely fail. Without Him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Let's respond together as the Spirit leads.
uh, for lunch in the fellowship hall. I have just a few instructions uh, for our lunch. If we would, we would uh, please allow our guests to go first, Dr. Cogdell and Gail, uh, the Parker family, and any of those who have traveled here some distance to be with us. If we would please allow them to have the seats of honor and to go first. Uh, we will go out of the door here by the piano side and then go around and turn in. That way if you need the restroom facilities on the way, you can, you'll be going right by those and then uh, go right through the line. There is a tent with some seating set up outside. Uh, if you uh, like the fresh air and if you are able, we would encourage you to go and utilize those seats first. If you'd like to sit outside and are able to, that way we will have enough room for those uh, in the fellowship hall that may not be able uh, to travel that distance outside. Uh, we also would ask that some of our, our younger folk would stay around at the conclusion of the meal and help us rearrange some things and get the tables and chairs from out of the, the tent so they can take that down this afternoon. Uh, we need those of you that have that good servant attitude to help uh, stay around for just a little while. Uh, let's bow now as we receive our benediction and also our blessing for the food. Gracious God, we stand amazed in your presence today of what you have done, of what you are doing, and what you will yet do. We believe the word of Scripture that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has yet fully conceived what you have in store for those who love you. We thank you, Lord, for that which we see and know in this place, and we recognize in our community, in our own families, Lord, all around us, there are things that we see and we know that they need some of this Jesus, some of this good news of the gospel to change their lives. So use us, Lord, uh, as we become uh, leaving the church gathered to become the church scattered out into the world. Use us, Lord, to be your witnesses, to be your faithful disciples, to be salt and light to this world so that the legacy of this light on the hill at Neal's Creek Baptist Church will continue to shine bright, that this place would continue to be a beacon of hope for our community. Lord, bless the food and the fellowship and the community that we are about to share as we go to this meal. Lord, may you be the invited guest at every table. May we feel your presence with us as we fellowship. Bless the hands that have prepared the food. Lord, and bless it to nourish and strengthen our bodies that we would be better servants for your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.